morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I am Bertrand Picard, chairman of the Solar Impulse Foundation, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Paris Peace Forum and in this special panel about the fifth anniversary of the Paris Climate Agreement with the question, is the climate ambition still alive? I believe it's a fantastic symbol to have a panel about climate change in a peace forum, because it's clear that more and more people start to understand now that local development, social stability, regional peace will be much easier with renewable energies, with delocalization of energy, with no fight to have energy because people can produce it and sell it locally. So this is a completely new philosophy, I think, when we can link climate change and peace. So it's my tremendous pleasure to welcome on this panel several people I know and I appreciate very much. First, John Kerry, former Secretary of State of the United States and a big friend of Paris. I met you, John, several times with President Macron uh, in, in Paris. We have uh, Barbara Pompili, who is a Minister of the Ecolog Ecological Transition. Mrs. Uh, Pompili has joined us. Welcome. Alok Sharma, uh, President of COP26, and Mohan Kumar, who is the Chairman, Research and Information System for Developing Countries. Welcome to all of you. And uh, I think we have in this panel a special novelty. Ten years ago for COP16, there was no solutions to clearly fight against climate change. No technological solutions, I mean. Five years ago at the Paris Agreement, there were solutions, new technologies, renewable energies, but they were too expensive. So it was very difficult to bring the economy, the finance and the industry on board. But now we see every day that the solutions to fight climate change, to be more efficient, exist and are financially profitable. Which means that we can have a completely different language to motivate the industry and the political world to join the climate ambition. Because today it starts to be logical, as much as ecological, to implement clean technologies and renewable energies. So this will allow a new way maybe to, to speak about climate. And it brings me to my first question to, to John Kerry. Um, with the new technologies that start to be profitable, do you think it will be easier to decarbonize the American economy? And will it facilitate also the return of the United States inside the Paris Agreement? Well, Bertrand, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to be part of this panel. I think everybody would agree on this panel. This is uh, not the best way to visit Paris. But anyway, we're, we're here and uh, celebrating uh, five years and thinking about the future. Um, obviously, technology is going to make an enormous difference. And yes, profoundly, the economic uh, possibilities have changed dramatically. Um, I, 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 but I want to I put that into a context. Um, I remember the moment of exhilaration when the plan was gaveled in in Paris at Le Bourget. And, um, you know, we celebrated and and uh, Laura Fabius did his thing, and, and Laurence uh, Tugiana and everybody. It was very exciting. But I remember saying to the plenary in the aftermath, moments later, that none of us should assume we're leaving Paris having guaranteed our citizens anywhere in the world that we're holding the Earth's temperature increase to 2 degrees centigrade. What we were doing was, by agreement, sending a message to the world that 190 countries plus we're all going to simultaneously try to move in the same direction. And that was going to affect the allocation of capital. Guess what? It did. For the first two years following Paris, more than $358 billion went into alternative renewable sustainable energy. 
First time ever more than in fossil fuel. But even as, as we began to develop these technologies and move in that direction, uh, regrettably, our president uh, pulled out of that agreement and gave an excuse to some countries that were always reluctant to join to, to hold back on being full partners in a sense. And Europe has done an extraordinary job of pushing forward and trying to, to keep the momentum going. And even in our states, we had 38 states in America where the governors all stayed, they stayed in, and more than a thousand mayors stayed in. So not hopeless, but here's the reality. Even if we did, and we knew this at the time, you know, we, we, what we did was we got an agreement where countries agreed to do what they were willing to do. What they, what, not what they could do, but what they were willing to do. And that is an agreement which if we did everything that Paris set out, the Earth's temperature will rise to at least 3.7 degrees, if not more. We're not doing everything, obviously, many parts of the world. So we're actually headed, if you listen to the scientists, to somewhere around 4.1, 4.5 degrees in the course of this century, which is beyond catastrophic. So, but Paris is in effect working in the sense that a lot of countries have moved. And now we're here preparing to go to Glasgow, which will be the follow-on meeting where we have to raise ambition. That's what Paris set out for us. It was a routine of the first four or five years. We come to the next meeting, we raise ambition. And I think it is absolutely critical for all of us to take note of the advance in technologies, take note of what the cost of solar and wind, uh, how it's come down, other things that are happening, brilliant, exciting things in the private sector, and recognize that the private sector now is going to be one of the critical elements of being able to not just do what we think we can do, but to begin to lay out the plan to do what we have to do. I think our citizens demand nothing less, and that's what I think makes this exciting, because the marketplace that awaits us in the doing of these things is the largest market the world has ever known. Four and a half to five billion users today, rising to nine billion users in the next 30 years. And if we actually fund the Green Climate Fund, and we actually do the things that the G20 as the major emitters ought to do, this is doable. And I think we have to approach Glasgow uh, with that point of view, uh, that uh, we have a moment here where the world is expecting something different, but the stage has been set by the Paris Agreement for something different to happen. And I think it's very exciting. I love your enthusiasm. It, it's wonderful, and I'm sure it will bring a lot of dynamic to, to all the people who are listening to us. Thank you very much, John, and I'll come back to you in a, in a few minutes. Now I have a question for Barbara Pompili, the Minister of the Ecological Transition of France. Uh, the world is facing two simultaneous crises, a short-term crisis, which is the COVID-19, and a long-term crisis, which is climate change. And in Europe, France is specially involved in this, we have this green recovery. So can you speak a little bit of it and how to put the priority or not on the economy, on the ecology? How are we going to make a win-win between the two? On ne vous entend pas. Là, vous allez m'entendre mieux maintenant. Ça va comme ça voilà. Très bien. Euh, juste pour vous dire tout d'abord que je suis très, très heureuse des résultats de l'élection américaine, puisque c'est un signal fort. Nous allons retrouver nos alliés américains autour de la table, à nos côtés, pour mettre en œuvre l'accord de Paris. Euh, je suis du coup très heureuse de parler euh, aux côtés de John Kerry aujourd'hui. J'ai envie de lui dire « welcome back, George ». Et John, pardon, et la crise de la Covid-19 qui arrive en ce moment est une crise euh, qui est un défi pour de nombreux pays, puisque nous allons avoir un risque qui est un risque réel euh, d'une reprise économique qui pourrait être fortement carbonée. Donc face à cela, nous devons être extrêmement vigilants et euh, oui. faire en sorte euh, de mener, que, notre, que la relance que nous voulons mener soit une, me, une relance qui serve de pivot pour l'action en faveur du climat. Et... Euh, 
je pense qu'aujourd'hui, euh, nous avons des signaux assez positifs qui sont face à nous, notamment les annonces de la Chine, du Japon, de la Corée du Sud, euh, qui, euh, qui sont des bons signaux, mais qui devront être suivis par des actes et des actions concrètes. Euh, nous espérons aussi que ça aura euh, des effets d'entraînement sur les autres acteurs et sur d'autres grands émetteurs. Euh, mais je crois qu'il faut qu'on euh, aille même encore plus loin. Euh, on doit être ambitieux. Euh, les banques japonaises, par exemple, euh, pourraient, euh, dans l'élan euh, qui, euh, qui est le leur, euh, arrêter euh, de faire des financements export sur euh, des, euh, des productions de charbon dans d'autres pays de la même région. Euh, je crois qu'il faut mettre un terme d'une manière générale aux subventions aux énergies fossiles. Euh, ça, c'est un point important par ailleurs euh, au niveau européen. La Commission européenne a publié un grand plan global de relance euh, de l'Union européenne, le Green Deal, euh, qui se fonde sur une approche qui est double, qui est de euh, stimuler les économies et de créer des emplois en euh, s'appuyant sur la croissance verte. Et dans ce cadre, et vous l'avez dit Bertrand, la France euh, s'engage résolument puisque nous avons lancé un plan de relance de 100 milliards d'euros euh, qui fait de la transition écologique à un, un levier stratégique puisque euh, 30 milliards seront entièrement consacrés à la transition écologique euh, en 2021 et 2022 en accélérant la transformation de tous les secteurs, euh, que ce, évidemment les secteurs émetteurs, hein, le, les transports, l'agriculture, l'industrie, les logements, bien sûr, et en soutenant le développement des technologies vertes qui doivent être un, un moteur de notre ambition. Et en ce qui concerne l'ambition climatique, nous avons un moment clé avec le sommet de l'ambition climatique qui aura lieu le 12 décembre pour célébrer l'anniversaire de l'accord de Paris, pour présenter de nouveaux engagements sur l'adaptation, sur l'atténuation et sur le financement. Mais ce que je voulais vous, vous dire, mon message principal aujourd'hui, c'est que la société civile nous attend et nous observe. Nous sommes attendus pour démontrer notre, notre ambition avant la COP26. Et cette année, nous avons pris conscience avec cette crise de la Covid que la nature euh, est imprévisible, que euh, notre environnement euh, est, euh, est central dans, euh, la, dans la mise en œuvre de nos politiques. Et c'est un point extrêmement important. Nous ne devons pas faire marche arrière dans notre programme et abandonner notre ambition dans un contexte qui, je le conçois bien, est difficile. Fixer le cap aujourd'hui, c'est aussi limiter euh, les événements environnementaux qui, euh, qui seraient extrêmes pour les générations futures. Et euh, je vais citer euh, le président de la République, le président Macron. Il l'a dit, l'accord de Paris, c'est une boussole. Donc maintenant que nous avons cette boussole, utilisons-la pour ne pas nous perdre dans ces temps troublés. Thank you very much, Barat. And uh, it's clear that France very often is showing a great pioneering spirit and the entire world will look with a lot of interest what you are doing in order to be able to, to follow the pace. Now, I will turn to, to Alok Sharma. Uh, Alok Sharma, you are the president of COP26. And I have a lot of compassion for you because in a way you must be very disappointed that the COP has been postponed by one year. But on the other sense, I think you are the first one in the history of the COPs uh, who is president for two consecutive years. <laughs> so this is a great thing that should probably raise your spirit a lot. <laughs> um, my question comes, of course, about the next COP26. In, in COP21 in Paris, there has been a novelty, which was the inclusion of non-governmental entities into the, 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 the COP negotiation. Uh, For COP26, are you planning any specific change in the way the COP are organized in order to, to have maybe more inclusive participations or are you planning any special surprises for us? Well, Bertrand, thank you very much uh, for that introduction. And uh, it's, of course, an honor to take part in the Paris Peace Forum and, and share a platform with, uh, with, with John and Barbara and, and Mern as well. Uh, the first thing I want to say to you is that I'm in, in, in very good spirits uh, when it comes to planning for COP26. And I've said right from the start that uh, we want this to be the most inclusive COP ever. Uh, you're absolutely right with, of course, and I think everybody understand this, uh, understands this, and I want to thank 
all our friends at the UNFCCC and, and other colleagues who agreed uh, for the postponement by a year. But the one thing I can tell you is that the level of ambition uh, has not uh, diminished. Uh, on the contrary, I think uh, people feel we, we need to push even uh, harder. Uh, and I do think, and this is why I'm encouraged in all the conversations I've had with uh, governments, with businesses, with civil society, I'm encouraged because I do think we're at that inflection point uh, where we're seeing governments uh, uh, talking about building back greener, Barbara just setting out uh, some of the things that the, the French government is doing. We, of course, in the UK are doing a lot as well in terms of our green agenda. Um, you're seeing uh, businesses come forward. John talked about uh, the, pri uh, the falling price of, of renewables. Uh, you're seeing the private sector also drive this forward. Uh, and of course, and then you have civil society. So it actually doesn't matter where you are in the world. You see some of the polling evidence which demonstrates that across the world, populations want their governments, particularly at this time, in a, uh, as we go into a sort of COVID recovery phase, they want us to build back better and build back greener. Now, in terms of uh, the planning for Glasgow, of course, uh, I'm very keen that we have a, a, a physical event. Uh, and I know that uh, you know, many of the non-state actors I've talked to, many of those parties are also very keen that we, we, we aim for that, we build for that. Uh, of course, uh, you know, one of the things that we've learned during this, this, this whole COVID crisis is that you can communicate uh, online. You don't have to be meet physically. I mean, I, I agree with John Kerry that I would love us to be sitting around a, a table and having this discussion uh, together uh, physically in the same place. But I think we've learned something from that. So if we can use that technology to allow COP to be even more inclusive, then I think we, we certainly will. And it's really important for me is that we, we champion and amplify the voices of, of those who quite often are the most marginalized, but frankly, they are the people who should be seen as the agents of change in this process. Uh, ultimately, of course, we are hosting this event on behalf of the UNFCCC, uh, and you know, we need to follow the, the, the commitments that are laid out in the host country agreement, but I think we are all agreed that this must be the most inclusive COP ever. And of course, as uh, uh, John has said, as Barbara said, we also want to make sure that this is also the most ambitious COP in terms of what we achieve. That's great news. Thank you very much, Alex Sharma. And you cannot imagine how much I look forward to, to participate in this very big milestone. It's going to be a crucial moment, really, to raise the ambition of COP21 in Paris and to get into a real-time action. So we look all forward. Now I turn to, to Mohan Kumar. We will speak of India, if you agree, because India has a little bit two faces. On one side, it is a great coal consumer, and it's clear that your country has to give access to energy to all the population. On the other side, you are incredibly wonderful pioneers with the International Solar Alliance, with the implementation of microgrids in the delocalized regions. So I would like to ask you to explain us a little more, a little better, how you manage these two sides of the energy and how you will think that you can really switch to the renewables as soon as possible. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And it's an honor to participate in such a stellar panel at the Paris Peace Forum. I think I want to begin by saying that um, you have 800 million people in the world who don't have access to any kind of energy. And you have 300 million of those who live in India. Um, a lot of others live in sub-Saharan Africa. What we've seen is a symbiotic relationship between energy poverty and extreme economic poverty. So if you want to achieve the sustainable development goal of no extreme poverty by 2030, you have to handle energy poverty because the one thing you can be sure is that if somebody experiences energy poverty, it completely shuts off any economic activity. At least that's what we have found in India. So that is the challenge that we have in India. Having said that, I do want to begin by saying and putting things in perspective, China consumes 51% of coal in the world, uh, not to compare, but India consumes 11%. We are both roughly the same population, as although there is no comparison between the level of economic development that China has achieved and India has achieved. I think the United States consumes as much coal as India, maybe a little more, 
but this is just to put it in perspective. Now, what we have tried to do in India is that during the pandemic, we have made sure that all coal-fired plants are idle and we have shifted completely to renewable. This is, of course, temporary. I'm not saying it's permanent, but it's had a great impact. We have established something like 12,000 megawatts of renewables just during this pandemic period. The trajectory uh, where India is shifting to a green economy is much earlier than we find for other economies. We have an installed coal capacity of 200 gigawatts, and we are shifting to a renewable economy. China did the same after establishing 1,000 megawatts of coal. So there is a big difference between the economies of China, India, and other developing economies. I would say that 2019, India, United States, and EU have reduced coal consumption. India has reduced coal consumption in 2019 for the first time in the history of its, of, of its life as a country, actually. So, uh, and China, on the other hand, and some of the countries have ended up increasing coal uh, consumption. We are the only G20 country, to the best of my knowledge, who have been given a clean chit by the G20, by the climate tracker dot org, a, a, a kind of non-governmental organization, if you like, which tracks emissions of different countries. So I'm not pessimistic. You are absolutely right. If you're asking me when we will achieve zero coal consumption, I'm not able to tell you. But I think the kind of progress we have made with the International Solar Alliance, the kind of reduction of costs that we are seeing of solar energy, the kind of wind energy that we are able to use in India, all these augur very, very well for India's long-term trajectory. Uh, excuse me, Chairman, but I'm a little skeptic about countries saying 2060, we will achieve carbon neutrality. I'm reminded of uh, Keynes, who said in the long term, we are all dead. Frankly, this is 2020. Small island economies want action now, not 2060, 2050. So I think we need to really um, get our act together. India is willing to play a part. I must say, as a long-time observer of India in the multilateral fora, and I'm sure Mr. John Kerry will agree with me, we tried to be part of the solution in Paris by launching the International Solar Alliance. Rather than be a naysayer or a rule taker, we tried to be a rule shaper in Paris. Uh, and this is something that's gone down very well in India. We have 87 countries which have signed the International Solar Alliance Framework Agreement. 67 countries have ratified it. If you're asking me how soon can we make this transition, then I would say it depends to a great extent on finance, on transfer of technology, and on capacity building. So I look forward to that, to the international community, but I want to be able to assert to you that there is sometimes a misperception that we consume enormous quantities of coal. We consume a substantial quantity, I'm not saying no, 11% is very high, but bear in mind that China actually consumes more coal than rest of all the countries put together. And it is a 14 trillion economy. We are a 2.7 trillion economy with, as I said, substantial number of people who suffer energy poverty. So that is really the challenge as far as India is concerned. But I believe the people in India are demanding action from the government as well in terms of air quality, in terms of reduction of pollution, in terms of the health issues we are seeing. So there is also domestic pressure for government to take action. So on the whole, I'm optimistic in the medium term. Thank you. Yes. And in addition to the solar initiative, uh, you are very well known for energy efficient initiative with the LED um, action that you have done ordering hundreds of millions of uh, LED lamps and reducing the price mm -hmm. from $6 to 60 cents. And this was absolutely uh, wonderful and the entire world has, has followed that. 
So now I would like to go on the second round of question. If your answers are a little bit shorter than the first time, we will have time to answer questions from, from the audience, uh, which would be great. We have exactly 30 minutes left. Um, let's remember that we are in a peace forum. And uh, I have a question now for John Kerry about the relation between the United States and China. In 2014, just before COP21, China and the United States have made this climate agreement that has brought you much closer to, to each other. Today, there is, let's call it a commercial war. Do you think it's possible to go back to an agreement on climate between US and China that will again bring you together in order to be leaders of a good cause for, for the world? Well, first of all, let me, I have to have a disclaimer here. Uh, in my answer, I am not speaking for uh, President-elect Biden or an incipient administration. I'm speaking for myself. Um, but uh, the simple answer to that is uh, we have to. We have to. Uh, I had the privilege of going to China within six weeks of becoming secretary, and I negotiated with President Xi the creation of the task force, which one year later produced President Obama and President Xi standing in the Great Hall of the People announcing our mutual reductions, and that created momentum towards Paris. We, we have no two. I mean, every major, frankly, every major issue we face globally today, from nuclear weapons, to cyber warfare, to pandemics, uh, to extremism, to human rights and challenges around the world, we, and, and particularly climate crisis, we have to have China at the table. And I would hope that um, the Biden administration is going to reach out. They have indicated, President-elect Biden has been very clear about his desire to uh, negotiate and engage. Uh, he knows President Xi. He's had a relationship with him. Uh, and, and this will not be in America, I can say with assurance, um, that uh, acts with the kind of arrogance we've seen over the course of these last four years, uh, where you begin uh, a trade war, you pull out of everything, Iran deal, Paris, TPP, run the list, without purpose, without rationale, without truth. So we're in a, a very different world right now. But we're also in a world where we have to be clear about the realities. I mean, I agree with Mohan. Uh, you know, first of all, India has been, uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi was extremely helpful in Paris uh, with the innovation initiative. Uh, and India is doing a great deal to try to uh, transition, but finance is an issue. I was in India two years ago. I met with Minister Goyal, who had been the negotiator at that time. Uh, he's in a different role now as a minister, but he made it very clear. If India has the finance, India will move immediately. There's no joy in building coal-fired power plants or relying on them. And so finance becomes a critical component of this. But look at the look at the Green Climate Fund. I don't think it's ever had more than about $10 billion in it. We pledged $100 billion. How can small nations around the world take us seriously if we're not willing to help them do the leapfrog to technology that they were promised in Paris? And, and so finance is critical. And what I see available to us today, which was not available five years ago in Paris, is a completely changed landscape on a global basis about the potential of finance. Wall Street and other financial centers are, are, are working with ESG, with the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, there is a new, uh, I think, uh, growing, hopefully, uh, sense in the boardrooms of the world that uh, that the shareholder stakeholder debate is now one that uh, is mainstream. People need to think about uh, the future in the context of where they're putting their money. We have $13 trillion sitting globally in net negative interest rate status for the last few years. I mean, that's an insult. There are, there are unbelievable projects which are revenue producing, transportation projects, energy projects, water projects, all of these kinds of things are, are revenue producing, and we ought to be able to leverage countless trillions of dollars of investment on a global basis to do these things. It takes leadership. You got to be willing to do it. 
the G20 last year, what did they come up with? $20 million for the Amazon that was burning? That's an insult. I mean, the G20, which is 85% of all the emissions of the world, has got to start to step up here. Now, I'm going to be very blunt about one thing here. China has done a great deal to move uh, in, a, in a thoughtful way with respect to its engagement uh, as a pretty mercantilist nation in the uh, production of solar and wind and the deployment of it, and they've done a great job in that. And they've shut some of their own coal plants. But here's the rub. Today, uh, more than 70% of all the coal-fired power plants being built in the world are being financed by Chinese money, Chinese banks. And the fact is that uh, I think there, there are 60 new coal-fired plants in Eurasia, Africa, South America that are being built, and they will come online with some 70-plus uh, 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 gigatons of uh, gigawatts, excuse me, the gigawatts of power, but there will be something like 400 or 370 or so uh, meg megatons of CO2 that comes with that. So it's going to erase the, the efforts of China and of a lot of other countries in the world. I believe there is a way for the United States and China uh, to step up together to address that question in a way that would help China to be able to manage its economy, but without exporting coal and coal-fired effects to the rest of the world. I think there's a way to do that. And hopefully, um, we can come together in the same way that we did previously. Uh, I know would be President-elect Biden is determined to change that relationship. Yeah, that would be wonderful. I, I, as always, John, I, I love your very clear language. You say things with direct words, and it's it's wonderful. And by the way, you brought me to the question that I wanted to ask to Barbara Pompili. It's precisely about this climate fund that should be 100 billion. You said very well that it's only 10 billion that is ready. If, and uh, if, yeah. we, know, we know that it's not a lack of money, as you said. Money is flooding everywhere. It's more the difficulty to allocate the necessary existing uh, re resources. So. Barbara Pompili, do you think that now we can maybe make a difference between development aid, where we give money, and investments that are profitable to earn money for the investors? And this will maybe facilitate the, the situation. Well, what do you think about that? It, it, it should be possible now to go faster because investments are becoming profitable. Oui, euh, d'abord, euh, Bertrand, moi, ce que je voudrais vous rappeler, c'est que cette crise sanitaire nous montre que nous avons une obligation de solidarité entre nous, euh, que ce soit euh, entre euh, les pays, les États, mais aussi les institutions financières, mais aussi euh, le, 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 les entreprises privées. Nous devons faire preuve de solidarité, en particulier, évidemment, euh, envers les pays les plus vulnérables, envers aussi les travailleurs euh, de, de ces pays qui sont touchés par la transition. Et donc, l'ambition, elle doit porter sur l'action climatique, mais aussi sur la solidarité. Et euh, nous avons en, en ce moment le sommet Finance in Common qui qui se tient actuellement, qui donne des signaux forts, puisque euh, toute la communauté des banques publiques de développement euh, vont se donner les moyens d'une véritable action concrète, que ce soit euh, sur la Covid, mais aussi sur les objectifs climat et sur les ODD. En ce qui concerne les 100 milliards, le rapport OCDE qui a été publié la semaine dernière nous donne quelques chiffres intéressants. Il, dit, il nous rappelle que les pays développés ont mobilisé 78,9 milliards de finances climat en 2018. Ce sont les dernières estimations que, que nous avons en soutien aux pays au développement, soit une hausse annuelle de 11%. La part des, des financements publics s'est élevée à 62,2 milliards. Donc vous avez raison, l'argent est là. Maintenant, il faut qu'il reste là. Et c'est un enjeu, surtout en cette période où la crise Covid peut entraîner un effet d'éviction des, des, des financements. J'aimerais aussi rappeler que l'Union européenne et ses États 
sont le principal contributeur des financements euh, climat bilatéraux avec 21,9 milliards en 2019. Et la France contribue largement à ces efforts puisque euh, en 2019, nous avons réalisé euh, presque 6 milliards d'euros de financements climat internationaux, dont 1,55 milliard sur l'adaptation. Euh, les pays au développement doivent aussi contribuer euh, en mettant en place un environnement favorable pour les investissements, euh, notamment ce qui aide à lutter contre le changement climatique, euh, au-delà des objectifs de long terme, d'adaptation et d'atténuation de, de l'accord de Paris. Euh, il y a un troisième objectif qui est d'aligner les flux financiers avec le développement bas carbone euh, résilient des économies. Et, et, et si on veut aussi que les finances euh, se réorientent vers euh, le climat, il faut aussi adopter des politiques publiques qui vont dans le bon sens. Euh, ces politiques publiques, ça peut être un prix minimum du carbone, l'arrêt des subventions aux énergies fossiles, la mise en place de budgets verts, les réglementations favorables au climat avec par exemple la divulgation des données financières et des informations sur les risques climatiques. Euh, je crois qu'on est vraiment à un moment où euh, la relance peut nous offrir des opportunités de reconstruire mieux l'économie. En France, euh, en parlant d'outils, vous me demandiez des outils, l'AFD a créé un outil financier qui s'appelle Adapt Action, qui apporte un soutien technique aux pays les plus vulnérables pour la mise en place de crédits liés au changement climatique. On a 30 millions d'euros qui sont investis sur 4 ans. Ce programme va bénéficier à 15 pays, notamment en Afrique et dans les petits états insulaires. Un, une autre initiative qui s'appelle Facilité 2050 a été lancée dans le cadre du One Planet Summit en 2017. 30 millions d'euros serviront aussi à, à, à la mise en place de stratégies de long terme, bas carbone et au développement résilient des pays en développement. Ce sont des instruments, voilà quelques exemples d'instruments qui sont indispensables pour permettre à ces pays de prendre aujourd'hui des décisions de long terme pour l'avenir. Et je peux donner un dernier exemple, le Fonds Vert a également développé des programmes spécifiques pour renforcer les capacités des institutions qui ont la charge de la planification des luttes contre le changement climatique dans les pays au développement et offre un soutien sur le terrain aux chefs de projets locaux pour mettre en œuvre des financements et des projets. Parce que la, la question des capacités fait clairement partie des priorités identifiées et des réponses que l'AFD met en œuvre à titre bilatéral, mais aussi des financements multilatéraux. Voilà quelques exemples que je pouvais vous donner, Bertrand. Thank you very much, Barbara Pompili. I know that Alok Sharma has to leave in exactly uh, 16 minutes. Uh, so I suggest that we move a little bit faster so we can have some questions from the audience. Uh, Alok, you have talked uh, already about the organization of COP26, but I know everybody wants to know more about it, about the organization, about the diplomatic initiatives and everything you, you plan. So you are creating a lot of suspense now and uh, everybody is keen to hear more about it. Great, thank you, Petra. Well, um, I think the one thing I want to say is, and I've said this to uh, the very many uh, uh, bilateral meetings that I've had with ministers around the world, is that, uh, yes, of course, uh, it is the, the UK which has a presidency uh, alongside our, our friends in Italy, but ultimately success at COP is going to belong to all of us. Uh, this is a shared endeavour uh, that we actually absolutely need to succeed at, uh, and we need to succeed, uh, succeed at this uh, not just for our generation, but actually future generations. Uh, and we will be judged on that, all of us collectively, what we did uh, in uh, getting this right. So what I'm trying to do at the moment, uh, and we are, of course, working with other partners uh, and uh, uh, making sure through our diplomatic network, uh, we are driving ambition. We're asking countries to come forward with ambitious NDCs, with ambitious uh, long-term strategies, uh, ambition when it comes to climate finance. Uh, you will know that... Um, Last year at the UN General Assembly, Boris Johnson announced that the UK would be doubling its uh, international climate finance commitment to 11.6 billion pounds between uh, next year and 2025. Uh, and I think John Kerry made this point that, uh, you know, there's a lot of money out there. We need to make sure that at least uh, on a public basis, we're able to get to this target of 100 billion a year to support vulnerable countries. Uh, and a, a number of them have, have made the observation to me when I've had conversations is that uh, quite rightly, 
uh, as a result of the, the COVID crisis, uh, uh, countries have mobilized a lot of capital. So capital is available. We just need to make sure that we also focus on getting to that target of a, a hundred billion. Of course, there is the, the private finance to be mobilized uh, as well. Um, in terms of the timeline between uh, now and COP26, uh, Barbara talked about the, the ambition event, uh, ambition summit that uh, uh, we are hosting uh, with the, uh, the UN, with, with France in partnership with Italy and Chile. Uh, that takes place on the, the 12th of December, marking the five-year uh, anniversary of, of, of Paris. And we're asking countries to come forward and show ambition at that point in terms of NDCs, in terms of long-term strategies, in terms of, of financing support for vulnerable countries. And then, of course, there is going to be a drumbeat of events uh, that take place between uh, uh, December and uh, COP uh, next November. Uh, and we need to make sure that at each of these events, uh, whether it's uh, uh, the World IMF Spring uh, or annual uh, meetings, or it's the, the CBD COP that China's having, or indeed uh, uh, the, uh, the G7, which uh, uh, the UK has got chairmanship of, and then G20, uh, which the Italians have, uh, moving into COP26 uh, itself, we need to make sure there is a golden thread. One of the golden threads that runs through each of these meetings is climate action. And if we do that and we work together, we will be able together to deliver success. I love this word, action. You're absolutely right. Thank, thank you very much. The, the question now to Mohan Kumar is also about action. It's about integrating technologies. Uh, I know that in India, you have a very interesting technological solution, which is called Basil. It's an Indian company who has made a nanogrid that allows to use uh, refrigerators or air conditioning with direct current, with DC instead of AC. For a house, it's 70 to 90% reduction energy use and, of course, uh, CO2 emissions. How can we, at the level of India, push this type of technologies, this one plus others, and maybe would it be an opportunity to create links in Asia, make maybe also a climate agreement with China, between China and India, like the US have done six, uh, six years ago, and, and try to push all these new technologies forward. What do you think? So I think that's uh, brilliant what you're talking about. I think we need to have local innovative solutions, and that is happening uh, uh, all over the country. Uh, we've uh, uh, put a cess on coal of $3 per tonne, which we're using for a clean development mechanism domestically to finance these kind of innovations. So that's, that's I think, great. As for cooperation between India and China, I think we, we can do a lot more with smaller countries as well. India is doing a lot with Bhutan in terms of hydropower in terms uh, uh, of hydropower, we have a lot of potential to do things with Nepal. We are trying to do things with Bangladesh and Myanmar. What we are talking about is a South Asian energy grid, if you like. And the more connectivity you have based on clean, green energy, so much the better. I, I want to go back to the original statement I made. It is South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa that suffers from energy poverty. I would say most of the funding needs to come here if really the world believes we have to have a better green future because you have millions and millions of people who need energy and the more you attract green energy, the more you tempt countries to invest in green energy in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, I think you would have won the game. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohan. Now we have a few minutes to get questions from, from the audience. And I'm, I'm very happy to see that the first question comes from Indonesia. So it's really not only a Paris Peace Forum, but a World Peace Forum. The, the question from Reza uh, Sigarki from Indonesia is, um, how to strike a balance between the right to commercialize green technology and green power with a universal need for a greener world. Who, who would like to, to answer among all four of you? Yes, go, go ahead, Alok. 
Great, thank you, Petra. It's a, it's a, it's a very good question. Look, I mean, I, I think what what we have to 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 look at, and I think what countries around the world are looking at, is uh, inclusive green growth. Uh, if I look back to what uh, has happened in the UK over the last 30 years, yes, we've had a, uh, an economic shock uh, because of the, the pandemic. But over the last 30 years, we have uh, managed to grow uh, our economy by 75 percent at the same time cut emissions by 43 percent. Uh, we have, uh, as a result of um, uh, uh, schemes that we've been put in place, uh, ensured that we've very rapidly uh, developed an offshore wind market, uh, the largest in the world now. Uh, and, uh, you know, John Kerry talked about the, pri uh, the, the falling uh, uh, price of uh, renewables and, and related technologies. So I think that the, the way I would look at this is that I think there is an opportunity here for a win-win where uh, at the same time as we're developing these technologies, uh, we are supporting jobs, we are driving uh, growth in our economy. But at the same time, we're also delivering a cut in emissions, uh, which ultimately is what we're all uh, uh, wanting to, to do. And, and that's what uh, the, this process and, of course, the process leading up to COP26 is all about. Excellent. Someone else on the panel would like to answer this question? If not, the next question, I'm sorry, it's also for Alok Sharma. You're the star, Alok. Uh, the question is, will the UK help raise the ambition for COP26 by announcing its NDC on December 12, and as has been widely reported, and its bilateral overseas finance for fossil fuels? Tricky question, no? <laughs> Tr tricky question. Um, look, I, uh, you know, in the same way that I, I uh, talk to other countries and uh, uh, ask that they show ambition, I, I also understand the UK itself uh, has to show uh, ambition. Uh, we are. Uh, working on what our NDC should be right now. Uh, we have a, a couple of uh, uh, cabinet committees that, that look at this, one of them chaired by the Prime Minister, one chaired by me. Uh, so uh, if, I can, if I can leave it like this, Bertrand, to say that uh, I recognise the need for my country to also show ambition. Excellent, excellent. And th this brings a question about all the subsidies that are given to the fossil energy. Uh, we're struggling to get money to renewable energies, to clean technologies, and on the other hand, there are 10 times more subsidies that are still given to fossil fuels. What would be the solution to change that? Maybe, maybe John, you have an idea? I have one idea. End the subsidies. Stop them. There's a zero rationale for those subsidies in today's world, period. I, I agree and, completely. And side, how how, how can we coin, do it? On the other side of the coin, uh, provide subsidies to alternative renewable, to the transition necessary. Uh, and, and again, it comes back to things like the Green Climate Fund. But look, uh, when, I, when I talk about the funding there, no, kind of, no group of people feel the pain of, of the absence of adequate funding than we do because we're re partly responsible. Uh, the Obama administration managed to quickly get a billion dollars into it uh, before we left, but uh, the Trump administration blocked the remainder of that funding going in. Uh, the, 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 so, you know, we desperately need that money. We also ought to be building a global consortium of uh, technology-capable countries that really are willing to pool resources and talent, brain power in order to push the technology curve. I mean, if you listen to the, everybody here listens to the scientists. The scientists tell us that even if we're successful in getting the economy to a net low carbon slash zero carbon economy by whatever date, uh, I, I think it has to be sooner than 2050 personally, but let's live with that moment. But even after that, we're going to have to get the long-term emissions that, that are up in the atmosphere, we're going to have to capture some of them. We need negative emissions technology. We need a lot of other things to be successful here. So I hope, I hope that uh, ending the subsidies will be the beginning of a really serious new initiative. Uh, you know, I remember in the 1970s, uh, a, a Saudi oil minister actually said that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones and the oil age will not end because we run out of oil. 
And that's the, so, you know, we're in a moment of transition here. It'll take 20, 30 years. We all understand that. But we've got to operate between, in, in, within the parameters of that critical carbon budget. And uh, we're, 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 the only way to do that is subsidize the things that are worthwhile and important, not the things of the past that are part of the problem. Exactly. So we saw in this panel that there are a lot of great intentions, that the people at the highest level of power are committed to change things for the best. And uh, I thank you very much. We're unfortunately arriving at the end of this uh, session. I thank you very much for all your positive words, all the hope that you have given to, to everyone, and also to respect the time because it made my life much easier. <laughs> if I was invited to moderate this panel, it's not because I flew around the world in a solar powered airplane. It's because the technologies that I could use to fly around the world with no fuel exist also for everything else in the world. And uh, we have now in my foundation selected more, more than 800 technologies, systems, devices, materials, products that protect the environment and at the same time allow the industry to make money and to create jobs. So all these solutions are yours. Uh, we are a non-for-profit foundation. All these technologies apply in the field of water, energy, construction, mobility, agriculture, industry. So if you need any help in the future for practical tools that will help countries to increase their NDC, to have very ambitious goals in terms of protection of the environment, you can just tell them that the solutions exist. They are profitable, they create jobs. And I think this is the way to, to reconcile ecology and economy. It is the way maybe to say that even if there was no climate change, we could replace all these old and polluting infrastructures by more modern and technological infrastructures. And the good news is that this pays for itself. It pays for itself. So when we speak of clean recovery, green recovery, it's also an efficient recovery. It's a modernization of, of our world. And maybe this can be like a motto also that helps some countries to be more ambitious in, in their MDCs. So thank you very much for everyone who has followed this panel. Thank you for the organizers. Thank you to Paris. We're sorry that we were not in Paris to do this forum. As John was saying, it's not the best way to visit Paris, but good times will come again. We'll all gather physically. And meanwhile, we have a lot of work to do in order to make the world a better, a safer, and a more peaceful place. So thank you and looking forward to see you again. Thank you. Take care.